political leader. While doing so, he positioned his city as a national leader on a number of important infrastructure initiatives before joining the Department of Agriculture's Rural, Rural Development. Andy was the mayor of Chattanooga, Tennessee from 2013 to 2021, where he served more than 180,000 res 180, residents and improved the efficiency and the day-to-day -day operations of local government. Under his leadership, Chattanooga operated its own wastewater system, received national recognition for improving access to high-speed internet for underserved communities. In addition to that, the city partnered with a variety of nonprofits, businesses, and county government to launch Tech Goes Home, a program honored for digital inclusion leadership by the National League of Cities and Google. At the end of his term, Burke Andy left, um, led a partnership to provide high-speed broadband at no cost to every family with a child on free or reduced lunch, making Chattanooga the first community in the country with such a benefit. It is no surprise then that Andy was, the, was named Digital Inclusion Trailblazer by the National Digital Inclusion Alliance in 2020. For those of you who um, don't know, we will, they will be here tomorrow during the specialized session. Andy was named Municipal Leader of the Year by the American City and County Magazine in 2015 and City Executive of the Year by State Scoop in 2020. He was also a member of the Tennessee State Senate from 2007 to 2012, and in that role he worked with, the ele with electric cooperatives and was a member of the Transportation and Education Senate Committees. Before joining Rural Development, Andy was a special representative for broadband at the National Telecommunications and Information Administration at the U.S. Department of Commerce. He holds a jur Juris Doctorate from the University of Chicago Law School and a Bachelor of Science from Stanford University. Please help me welcome Andy. Okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll stand here then. Um, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be back in Pittsburgh. I think that this is my fifth trip to Pittsburgh this year. Fifth trip this year. I'm a little reluctant to say it because I know we have, you know, uh, legislators and local officials in this room, and I'm worried that you're going to send me an income tax form because uh, I've been here so much. But, you know, I guess if I have to pay it, I have to pay it. Um, I, I know that we have a tremendous number of influential people in this room. Uh, I believe in local leadership and the way that uh, you can really make a difference in the lives of the people you serve. It's an honor for me to be with you, and so thank you for having me. Appreciate uh, the university for hosting this and for having the idea uh, to make this happen, so um, I'll try to Make sure I'm the last person of the day. We're going to get ourselves fired up about infrastructure and particularly internet, and then uh, we'll leave you to the to the chancellor and to to uh, dinner. Um, here's what I'm going to do with my time. I'm going to start a little bit with my story. I know you just heard part of it, but I'm going to go into that a little bit more in depth. Uh, talk a little bit about what is happening uh, at the federal level, and then make sure that we get any questions that you have. So. Um, so let me start kind of with an overview of where things are. We are at a, trans we are at a transformational moment when it comes to high-speed internet. We've never seen investments and commitment like we have in 2021 and 2022 on this level. So in uh, early 2021, President Biden said his pledge was to ensure that every American has access to affordable, reliable, high-speed internet. Congress then backed that up by passing the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, which put $65 billion, that's a billion with a B. As a former mayor, I have a hard time saying billion, but I'm getting, getting more used to it in my time in the federal government. $65 billion to go towards high-speed internet for all. And having worked on this at the federal level now, basically since the bipartisan infrastructure law passed, I can tell you that we take every word of that pledge very seriously. Affordable, reliable, high-speed internet for all. Not some, not more, not many. 
And that's really what has changed now uh, and is so transformational is over the course of the last decade, we've seen plenty of attempts to expand access, to give people more opportunities, to build more. And now we are changing to a formulation where people think about internet like they think about roads and water and electricity. This is a baseline that everybody in our country should have in order to have the opportunity to succeed. That's where we are and that has been a real change. And I say this as somebody who has been working in this area for a long time, uh, uh, tilling this soil which has been dry and now all of a sudden we're starting to see things come up uh, and the plants emerge. So uh, as, as you heard, I'm from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Chattanooga's story is a lot like that of Pittsburgh. In 1969, Walter Cronkite, who was then, as many of you know, called the most trusted man in America, named Chattanooga as the dirtiest city in our country and did a one-hour special on Chattanooga. You're welcome, Pittsburgh. Uh, <laughs> So much like the area that we're in, Chattanooga is a valley surrounded by mountains. A river cuts through the middle of the city. There is uh, bridges all over the place. Sound familiar to anybody around here? And because we had so many smokestacks from my office in City Hall, uh, there were 60 mills and foundry within a mile and a half of my office at one point in time. Because all the the smoke billowing out stayed in that area. It made our city one of the dirtiest places in the world. Thanks to the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, but also the, the investment of local officials and the civic sector, Chattanooga cleaned up its act. And by 2015, while I was mayor, Outside Magazine called us best town ever. Quite a, quite a change over the course of those decades. One thing that really helped us, though, was that we decided that we would invest in our downtown, but also in the infrastructure that would bring people to our community. We built out the first high-speed internet connections to every single home and business for 600 square miles. Every single home and business for 600 square miles. We turned it on and became the first gig city. This was done by a entity called EPB, which is an electric utility owned by the city. I was fortunate enough to uh, get to appoint all the members of that board. EPB, again, was part of the city government. And so if you had an electricity connection at your house, which everybody did, or at your business, which everybody did, you all of a sudden had the fastest connection in the Western Hemisphere at your home. In uh, 2015, we became the, then the first city to go from one gig to 10 gig at every single home. And after I left uh, being mayor in the last couple of months, they went to 25 gig at every single home and business. Incredible, incredible. As part of that, one of the things that I saw was that uh, pretty early that a connection wasn't enough. We, we needed to do something with it, especially because when we turned it on, we thought, well, Apple and Google are gonna come here. This is one place where uh, Pittsburgh is ahead of us, right? Google is here. And that, that didn't happen. But all of a sudden, we invested in the local economic development. We started to see some startups pop up. We had some exits where people sold their startups. The scene really took fire. And all of a sudden, we were in all those articles about what is going on in, across the country in the places that aren't the so-called superstar cities. Uh, we had one of the highest wage growths in the country, the third highest wage growth in the country. And in 2020, Forbes said we'd be the number one place in America for new jobs. Now, 2020 didn't turn out exactly like we planned, but the point is that I've seen what these kind of investments can do for people and communities in the long run. We also understood that this needed to be used by everyone. And so uh, we started putting together these tech go ho goes home classes. These are classes that would ensure that people uh, had the skills to use the internet and to, to also um, could afford it. As, as you heard, we became the first community in the country to have free ultra high speed internet 
for every single family with a child on free or reduced lunch. So in Chattanooga now, if you've got a Title I kid, your internet is free, and that's 300 download, 300 upload. So people may not know exactly what speeds look like. That's fast. That's, that's plenty fast for, for people around the community. And this was really what we did to try to ensure that there was fairness and people, people could participate all around. And I saw also what was happening, not just in Chattanooga, but right around us. So when I became mayor, I formed, uh, because I had been a state senator, as a state senator, I had represented not only the city of Chattanooga, but also a rural county next door. I understood what the problems were there. We tried to expand our internet out to the rural areas. Um, the state actually sued us to stop us from doing so and was successful ultimately in that endeavor. Uh, but we still partnered and found ways to do that. I started a uh, regional mayor's council, which crossed not only uh, county lines, but also crossed state lines because we're right on the border with Georgia. And we would meet on a regular basis to figure out how we could work together. And there were different ways that we were able to partner with our rural uh, communities and ensure that they had some benefits from what we were doing. But it was, it was criminal that we had the fastest internet in the world right in our own community and 10 minutes away across a border, an artificial border, right, that nobody cared about. There were people with dial-up speeds. So for, uh, just to give you some idea, one gig is 1,000 download or 1,000 upload. Uh, a a dial-up connection uh, or a uh, DSL connection might be 10 download and or two or three upload. So again, 1,000 versus 10. And as I said now, Chattanooga's at 25,000 at every single home and business, 25,000. So this is the discrepancy that cannot stand. So as we enter 2021, and again, I spent much of the last decade talking about digital equity, ensuring that people had the, the access to the connection, but also the, the resources to, to afford it, the, the, uh, the skills to use it, and the devices that they needed. As we enter 2021, all of a sudden, President Biden puts this at the top of the agenda in a way that it just hasn't been there before just hasn't been there before. And I was able to come in as the special representative for broadband and start participating and seeing this up close. So here's, here's what this means. And I don't know if there's a, it, is, if there's a clicker for the advancement or where, where that particular piece is, but um, of that $65 billion, and by the way, the $65 billion doesn't count all these other investments that you're starting to see from the American Rescue Plan, uh, from the CARES Act, all these different places. Of that $65 billion, we had $14 billion goes to the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, for what is called the Affordable Connectivity Program. Now, by the way, one thing that you're gonna see from me is I really don't like, I really don't like acronyms. If you, when you're in the federal government, everything, it's incredible, everything is an acronym. I think if the Bill of Rights were done today, they would call it the BOR, okay? It's just everything. So you might hear ACP, that's, that's the term that people say. I'm still gonna say the Affordable Connectivity Program. I'm gonna make one exception, which you'll hear in just a minute. $14 billion for the Affordable Connectivity Program, which says that any person who makes 200% of poverty or less can have a uh, $30 voucher to afford internet. If you live on tribal lands, that's $75 a month. Again, every single provider, because the president and vice president actually went out and then talked to all the different major providers, every single major provider now will offer a $30 plan of at least 100 download speed, uh, which means that for those families, internet is free, free. $48 billion went to the National Telecommunications and Information Administration for, uh, for a couple of different things. One is the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Act, BEAD. I have to say BEAD because the other stuff is just way too long. $42 billion for that. And that, those are dollars that flow through the state 
and Pennsylvania will have the responsibility and the actually be compelled to ensure that every single person within the state has access to a high-speed internet connection when all those dollars are spent. Every single state will do this and NTIA will be working with the states and have to approve a plan that at the end of the day shows people in your community have access to, to the internet. That, that is huge for us. There's $2.75 billion for digital equity. What do we mean by digital equity? Again, that's that, that three-pronged stool. It is affordability, skills, and devices. $2.75 billion. The amount of money that was in the, uh, the federal budget before that was zero. And so this is a huge opportunity. Roughly half of that, $1.5 billion, goes through the state. So again, Pennsylvania will get its share of that. And then, um, and then there's $3 billion for tribal lands. Again, uh, I, I had not had a lot of experience with tribal lands. I spent a fair portion of this year uh, working through those issues. Uh, our tribal, um, our Native Americans have been incredibly neglected and left out by this world, seeing that those dollars has been transformational. And then $1 billion for what's called middle mile, those fiber connections that may run down the highways and the main arteries so that you can then hook off of that to your neighborhoods and to your businesses. And then $2 billion went to the United States Department of Agriculture, where I am right now, uh, and to the, to the Rural Utility Service specifically, so that we could use that for what's called ReConnect. ReConnect is the most aggressive area today where we're connecting up rural Americans to high-speed internet. We do this, uh, we've been doing this now for a few years. Uh, unlike the bead and some of these other places where the dollars go through the state and they're planning for the future, ReConnect is doing this work today. Um, so did we, were we able to find something? Okay. Yes. Oh, I see. Oh, it's hiding, hiding in plain sight. Um, so, so you can start to see uh, what these investments look like in, uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, we've been putting together these, these dollars, uh, and even before our $2 billion starts coming out, uh, you're starting to see here's, here's what the different uh, initiatives that we have look like and how we're putting them into play right here in Pennsylvania. For example, as we, as we sit here last week, we just started our distance learning uh, and telemedicine grant program. This is only for rural America. And what it does is it allows us to make sure that clinics and doctors in rural America can, can uh, administer telemedicine to people in their community. That is open right now. And so these different places are ways that we can ensure not just that connection, but that equitable piece, the, um, the, the affordability, the devices, the skills uh, that people need. And here in the next few weeks, you'll start to see this Community Connect grant program as well for communities which have 28,000 people or less. And that's about these community centers and making sure that families and kids can go to the community centers uh, and, and be part of the learning process there. Again, this will be coming out soon. And here, Bob Morgan is our state director. Uh, you can contact him about these things. I wanna make sure that, we, uh, that you have that information. I'm gonna leave that up there. Um, so this is, this is what we are doing today and just a couple months ago, we closed our most recent $1.1 billion round. I know that there are many Pennsylvania applications for that. Uh, and you'll start to hear over the course of the next month or two, we're gonna start making grants on that $1.1 billion round in places all over the country. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll be looking at many of those applications uh, from Pennsylvania as well. This is part of this transformative moment. 
Before I kind of close out, I just want to make sure that I add one thing that is not on the program. This is my old mayoring coming out, which is they ask you to talk about X and then you talk about Y instead. I apologize for this, but I feel like it's important to say. So uh, we also have, again, if you just think about the amount of transformative legislation that has been passed in the last year, it's pretty amazing. So uh, we also had the Inflation Reduction Act. And as part of the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, our US, again, where I am, we got $11 billion to, do, to fight climate change and to decarbonize in rural America. That's what it's for. And uh, so for those who might be representing uh, rural America, this is incredibly important. And there are all kinds of different ways that we're going to, to use this that's being set up right now. Um, I'm happy to, to chat with anybody at, at a later point, not on this, but this is, a, again, uh, the largest investment that we've ever seen in renewable energy and fighting uh, uh, you know, our rising climate problems. And so I'm excited about what that's going to, to do because it really is so critical that rural America has access to these same opportunities that urban America does. And I say this as somebody who spent most of the last 15 years uh, representing at least in part an ur very urban part of the world. Um, so I'm gonna open it up for questions. Um, before I do, I just wanna relay a couple of stories that I know that y'all have heard, uh, various versions of these. Uh, but I think about them when I come to places like this. So uh, this year, I've been to at least 31 different states, uh, and many of those states multiple times. As you heard, been to Pittsburgh uh, all these times, and I've also been other places in, in Pennsylvania. Um, what you see when you go out and you hear from people who don't have access to this is how devastating it is because they can't communicate with their families, can't get the education that they want, the jobs or the opportunities aren't there. And so um, I just wanna leave you with a couple of images that uh, I know are gonna change. I drove up uh, to, a, um, to a school in uh, Mississippi and I was looking for a parking space and I saw a sign that said, for best internet, park here for best internet park here. I talked to a, a man named Jimmy who had relatives in Chattanooga when I was in Pawnee, Oklahoma. And uh, Jimmy had gone back to college because his kids, he was telling his kids to uh, finish college and they were saying, why dad, you never did. And so he went back to college and he was in his last semester when, uh, the, when the pandemic hit he didn't have access to internet, couldn't take his exams online and ended up having to go to college for another year because he dropped out. Um, as you start thinking about these stories, and I've got so many of them, I think this is why President Biden thinks that this is an, this is an essential part of his legacy. This infrastructure piece is so important and particularly internet for all because we can't have these stories in the United States of America. We can't have them in Western Pennsylvania. We can't have them anywhere in our country for people to thrive. So I'm excited to be part of this. Thank you for having me here and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, hi. Sasha Monrath from Penn State University in the X Lab. Um, I'm really curious about, and you've alluded to this quite a bit, the sort of the opportunity costs at the individual household level. Uh, the best analysis I found is from like 2015 by the federal government. And I feel like this is a real missing element. So I just wanna put on your radar this notion of like being able to quantify the detriments to households that have no broadband would be a very powerful tool that currently is missing from our arsenal to drive home that this is really a matter, kind of an existential threat, not just for communities, but at the individual level in terms of the, the costs borne by the, the disconnected. Uh, and I'd be curious about your thoughts on that. 
I think you're exactly right. Also, just in general, I'm a movement builder. Like that's the way I think about this is, this is not our, gonna be our last investment in digital equity. We're gonna have to keep making digital, this is, this is gonna have to be a recurring piece. And so showing what failure to have access, meaningful access means, it's gonna require people to have some kind of evidence to, to build the movement as to why this is important. So um, the only, the, the best thing that I can tell you that at least I tried to do is when we decided to make internet free for every person in Chattanooga with a, with a child on free or reduced lunch, one of the things I was most excited about was this is not just about kids because there are lots of people who live in that home who are adults, who are parents, who are grandparents, who are aunts and uncles, whoever it may be is in, in that home. And uh, we actually uh, engaged a university uh, to do a longitudinal study about the effects that it was having on people to change that, that type of access in their homes. And so we wanted to build that evidence. Uh, Chattanooga, um, as I said, I spent a lot of the last decade uh, talking about this stuff. And, and having that kind of proof, I think people know it intuitively, but that, that quantification, that little piece of, of additional evidence that is always powerful, and I agree with you that we need it. Hi, um, Alyssa Chalodowski. Hello. <laughs> I'm with United Way of Southwestern Pennsylvania, and I was just wondering in the example of Chattanooga, if you could talk a little bit about the nonprofit community and whether they were involved in helping you identify where resources were needed and then also providing some of the technology. The nonprofit community in Chattanooga is incredibly strong, and uh, particularly the philanthropic community is incredibly strong, and so we rely on that. I know you have Heinz here. I've spoken at some Heinz events uh, back when I was mayor as well. So um, Chattanooga, uh, this is a little, little great little fact. Um, in right around 1900, uh, a guy from Chattanooga drove down to Atlanta and bought the rights to bottle Coca-Cola uh, for one dollar in perpetuity, one dollar, uh, plus the cost of the of the soda. Okay, Coke spent the next hundred years trying to get out from under that deal. By the way, um, so so we had an amazing philanthropic community that kind of came up, sprang up from from that deal, uh, and the families who benefited from that. And so. Um, our nonprofits were huge. Uh, and I started a nonprofit called the Enterprise Center. I would encourage people who are interested in this to kind of look a little bit about the Enterprise Center in Chattanooga. And because I thought that if, if I showed up in my suit at people's door and knocked on it and said, hey, I'm here to give you internet, they're gonna say, what's the catch, right? What's the catch? Don't believe you. And so we needed nonprofit partners to be trusted messengers, to be partners in the community, to make sure that we were talking not to certain types of individuals and certain groups, but we were talking and, and, uh, and partnering with everybody throughout our area. And so the Enterprise Center, lots of different people, including the United Way of Chattanooga, um, they all participated. And in fact, uh, the way that we funded our our uh, internet for everybody uh, with a child on free or reduced lunch is various nonprofits, various philanthropies, the city and others, we all put money into a nonprofit to fund this because essentially uh, there were laws that prohibited us from doing that directly. We can get into that, but um, let's just say I've been sued many times about all kinds of things related to this. Uh, and, and we learned our lesson, which is we had to figure out a different way way to do that and so i would just say that that's why I, I think as i started this i said local partnerships and and community leaders civic leaders are essential they were certainly essential to to our success in chattanooga hi sorry way back here thank you for a great presentation you you beautifully explained how this technology with broadband is just holding back so many families and communities. Uh, so I really appreciate that and the emphasis on the fact that we've waited so long and finally this administration has shown the type of leadership that we've really needed 
uh, for broadband, I'm with the local foundation, the Benenham Foundation, and we've been uh, working really hard in the state of West Virginia to amass kind of a strategy around supporting communities in making the applications, which are so complicated, to actually draw down these funds. This is a big concern of ours. And I just wanted to say, um, we're seeing really great success, and our biggest has come through NTIA. We have a community in West Virginia serving a very small area that now leveraged like $19 million for their own local broadband build out. It's remarkable, and so we are helping do this with so many federal sources now, and as you mentioned, they're coming down from different channels in all these different ways, and I think it's a tremendous opportunity for rural communities for rural communities to own this, lead this, and kind of take this on for themselves. I guess my question for you is, uh, you did talk a little bit about philanthropy with the last question. Are you seeing uh, foundations, or is there a way that you're trying to uh, encourage other foundations, like the Benenham Foundation, what we're doing to use our philanthropic dollars to provide funding for grant writers, um, designers, um, other support for nonprofits just to make sure their 990s and their audits and their tax status is, is good so they can apply for federal grants and actually be successful. So great. Um, and I know, I know the grant. I, was, I tried to get to Pennsylvania to actually give out that, that grant that you're talking about, but um, I was in too many other places, couldn't quite get there uh, for, for that one. That's a, that's a phenomenal award that, that we did over there. Um, so uh, yes is the, is the answer to, to your question. I think there are a couple, couple lessons that I would just impart to people here. And number one is you need a plan. You need a local plan. You need to know where your problems are, where your assets are, what, what you're gonna do, what you wanna see, how you're gonna use this. It's not just a matter of like, federal government's gonna come in and save us, we're gonna give some money to the states and then the states are gonna do this and everything's gonna be perfect. I, listen, I wish that were the case, but it's gonna involve local leadership as a huge piece of this. And so having a plan, having a digital equity plan, making sure that you have the people at the local level who can do this, that's critical for everybody. And uh, I'm a big believer in, to, in planning, but also in the execution of plans. I think that's where sometimes uh, communities get tripped up is they do a plan, they put it on the shelf, it looks great, and then nobody actually does it. I think these, this is a huge opportunity. Get your plan and then execute on it. And certainly this capacity issue is a real problem, especially in rural communities, those without a lot of wealth. And um, yeah, they don't have grant writers just sitting around waiting for the county mayor to say, hey, let's go, go. That's just not out there. And so philanthropy has been and can even more step into the breach. So can local nonprofits. So can, by the way, if you're here, private industry step into the breach and partner with people because this capacity issue in government is real. It's just real everywhere. And I know that I met some commissioners before we got started. They're doing their work with probably either one or zero assistance, right? And that's a, that's a big struggle. And, and anything that people can do uh, not to step in place of them, I'll just put it this way, but to help empower those local elected officials that's great. Okay, we have a long line of people who want to ask you questions. So I'm going to go Carrie, then Angela, then Chris, then Laura. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Carrie Harris. I'm with an organization called Literacy Pittsburgh. We're an adult education provider doing lots of digital skills work. Uh, as, you, as you know, you can't even look for a job without having digital skills. Uh, you can't uh, interview for the job. Sometimes you can't do the job. And it's hard to support your kids in school without skills. So my question for you is, how did you approach it in Chattanooga? Um, and, and what work was done on skills and who did it? Uh, and any lessons you can share? So back to the, back to that inter, to the Enterprise Center. So um, 
I'm sure that there might be something like this locally now, but uh, we were really at the head of this skills issue. And, um, and so the Enterprise Center started something called Tech Goes Home. And what that was, was it was a train the trainer. And it was mostly partnerships with churches and local community centers and, and all kinds of different uh, places that were embedded in neighborhoods. And uh, there was an eight week class and at the end of it, you got a, a free laptop, okay? So if you went through that, and that was really where we started was Tech Goes Home. Uh, and one of my favorite stories was, uh, I, w I wanted to go to a class in that first, the first group that we funded. And I just remember I was in a church and I walked in and the first person presenting was Gwen. She was a senior. And she got this computer so that she could email her kids, but she didn't know how to turn it on. And so uh, when I went to this class, she described as I was walking in how she had Googled the speaker at her church that weekend, done a flyer, printed it out, and gave it to her friends, and everybody in the room clapped. And I was just like, the hair on the back of your neck just stands up. I mean, it's so powerful. And so we started there, but we quickly learned that that wasn't enough. And so then we had a, 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 a second tier that was, how do you do a spreadsheet? How do you use a Google Doc? And, and then at the same time, we were kind of starting at the top of this, which was, how do you become a junior coder? And all of a sudden, really, what I saw was we needed a ladder. We needed a ladder and different entry points for people on each rung so that they could get there. And we built it out the best we could, especially with the budget. There was plenty more to do. But that was really some of this. We started building this ladder of different places and entry points for people. And so that as you, if you finish that Tech Goes Home one, you could say, OK, I want, now I want to learn how to do Google Docs. OK, I did that. I'd love to learn how to do a little coding. We'd have another. OK, I've, I learned how to do a little coding. I'd love to figure out how to be a junior coder. OK, there's a little place. Now I learned I want to be a senior coder. Um, and all those different places are important for people to have uh, an entry point. Hello, everyone. I'm Angela Mike, um, Executive Director at Pittsburgh Public Schools for Career and Technical Education. Um, first, I want to applaud you for all your hard work and efforts to make sure that um, the folks that you were working with had ex access to internet. Um, my question, you answered the first part already about skills, and I love um, the tech going home and the, the course that you talked about. My question is around how do you get the devices, or best practices, rather, to get devices in the home. So they might have the access, but at least the parents and the students that I deal with in Pittsburgh Public Schools, they don't have the devices. Well, that's, um, that's disappointing. Um, we need people to have access to devices. So I would just first, um, from a national level, we do have this $2.75 billion that is gonna um, be available for digital equity. And that's one of the three stools of digital equity is devices. Again, devices, affordability, skills. And so Pittsburgh or any other community can come up with a plan, submit it to the state, and then when the state receives its portion of this money, the state has to use um, those local plans at least to some extent to, to uh, fund its efforts. So um, happy to talk to you more about that, but. I would just urge you to be looking at these digital equity funds. Um, the second piece I would just say is that, you know, there's, at least in Tennessee, we had all kinds of one-to-one -one efforts. Um, the, the, of course, the, the problem was frequently that we saw was that people didn't have internet at home, even though they had devices. And so you kind of have, you have to have all these pieces matched up. That's the that's the reality is you can't have the device and not have the connection and you can't have the connection and not have the device. It, it, you've got to have both. And so um, obviously I hope that whoever it is who's responsible for education policy that they're, I'm sure they're taking this seriously. This is a real issue, but um, you know, I know from my own kids, I'm sure this is true everywhere, uh, that what we want to see is we want to see young people exploring, at least, let me speak for myself. I want to see young people exploring and uh, finding their own paths. And the place where you might learn a little bit about dance or music or how to play the guitar or how to cook some meal that is different 
or I just really interested in the French Revolution and I'd love to see all these different pieces about it, where do you where are you gonna get that today? You can get that on the on the web. And so this chance for people to engage their own creativity, we have to that access requires an internet connection and the device to use it. Chris? Thanks, and uh, hi, I'm Chris Belasco, the Chief Data Officer for the City of Pittsburgh. Um, I report to Heidi Norman, who has been working with you and will be on the panel tomorrow. And one of the things I'm undoubtedly going to be thinking about with her over the next you know, two years is how to show change, how to identify sort of where we are at connectivity with base, at the baseline here now before the digital equity um, coalition really kind of takes off here um, in the region. That's cool. But I, I'm struggling with the, you know, the, the various ways to show connectivity, right, at the local level here. I know that you could get speed test data. You, you know, Ookla makes it available. There are, um, you know, Southwest PA Commission has put out some maps that they're a couple of years old and so they're a little stale. Where are you seeing at your level the, the connected you know, connectivity measures that, that we could show so we could, like, identify change over time? Yep. Well, the first thing is the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, just released its broadband data maps two weeks ago or so. And I would encourage anybody to go on there and look at that who is interested in this because they're pretty detailed, which is different from saying that they're accurate. Okay, so let me, let me make sure that I, I make a distinction between those two things. And the reason that that's important is because it does have an incredible amount of detail, and if they aren't accurate, then people need to, there's a process to fix them, and people need to engage in that process. But, but they are a good, that's, that's a good starting point, and because it's the place where federal policy and state, because of the way that, that the dollars are gonna flow through the state, that's probably the place that states are gonna start as well. I think that that's, that's a good place to engage as these, these federal communication uh, commission broadband maps, as well as, yes, there are all kinds of private places to do this. Ookla speed data, if you've, you know, ever done something on your Ookla, like if you've downloaded that app and they've got all kinds of different information and, and we meet with them. Uh, and then there are private services um, that are doing this as consultants to cities as well. But I think you're right, like the, in the long run, We've got to have a baseline. We've got to show what we're doing. And as I said, this is not the end of the road. I'll, I'll be honest and say Congress isn't going to wake up in January and go, you know what, we need, we need the $65 billion into broadband. Like, that isn't going to happen. I, I'm sorry. But, um, but it would be great if we were building also enough information so that we do it right, we do it right this time, we get the dollars where they need to go, but also we're building the case for what, what work needs to be done in the future. Uh, hi, just wondering uh, from an advocacy perspective, if you can speak to the level of coordination and interagency planning between AG, the FCC, Appalachian Regional Commission and others. There are lots of money, lots of agencies. Sort of how do you navigate where to go and, and how to make the case? Yeah. Great question. I'm missing my four o'clock White House meeting with all those people uh, to, to chat with y'all. Um, so uh, one of the biggest, um, I know, con points of confusion, let's put it that way for people is, Treasury has money. <laughs> NTIA, National Telecommunication and Information Administration has money. We have money at the Rural Utility Service. FCC has money. There are different definitions, there are different, and then, by the way, the states are all doing their own, their own thing. And so um, you, can, you can lose something when you, when you have all those different pieces. So we are trying, however we can, including these meetings that uh, hopefully somebody from my office is, is speaking up for right now, but, but we, we, have to, we have to help local communities navigate these issues also, and so I think you know to the earlier question about about different roles that local groups can play in helping navigate that. That's great, um, but also um, you know we're happy to chat with you about what is the best thing that might fit your pieces. I mean, if you look if you look at our various 
um, initiatives right there, obviously there's a whole bunch of different stuff that, that's going on. And so for rural communities, how do we make sure that we, we get you to the right place? Um, it's not easy. I'm not going to pretend that it is, but, but there are a lot of opportunities and you just can't miss. You know, you got you to pick one of them and go with it. All right, well. We have one more question oh. at the back of the room. Great, thank you. Um, so Andrew, again, I'll just echo the sentiment. Uh, really appreciate uh, all your work and all of your leadership in this area. And I should say, my name's Alka Patel and I'm with Comcast, full disclosure. So um, two questions. One to piggyback off of the question that was just asked before. Um, so to your point around all of these states and as we think about the digital equity plans, they're all doing their own version of a digital equity plan. And so just curious in terms of what does um, oversight look like at a national level to make sure that the, the funds and the work is actually meeting the intent of, uh, in the spirit of what it was meant to do, right, in terms of access to rural areas and so forth. So that's, that's question number one. And then question number two is that um, I'd be curious to learn what are your best practices that you've seen as it relates to ISPs being uh, part of the conversation and being engaged in the work? Because I can just share, you know, my, my, my perspective is that as cities, communities, the state, as they all do their programming and their planning, um, there's, there's hesitancy to have ISPs at the table because they, there's a perception of conflict of interest and, and so forth. And so just curious, because I do think, just like you said, there's a lot of different pieces to access, to device, to skills. Similarly, it's a joint uh, effort from my perspective in terms of uh, private sector, public sector, and community organizations. So just curious as to, 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 to best practices you've seen. Yeah, so I'll, let me take the second question first, and then I'll, I'll end with the, with the other part. So. Um, there are a bunch of different models. Chattanooga had a public model. That's, that's what EPB is, is it's authority owned by the city, and I believe in that model, okay? I'm not believe, but I don't believe in that as the only model, let me just be clear. It's a model that worked, and it worked for us for all kinds of different reasons. There are cooperatives, which are nonprofits owned by members. There are purely private large-scale ISPs like Comcast and Charter and AT&T and you, you know, the, you know the, the list. And there are small mom and pops out there, plenty of small mom and pop uh, places that, that are out there that are for-profit. Um, and, you know, I, I always say, like, <laughs> the wrong answer is none of the above. And the reality is that um, you might have some competition in Pittsburgh and various choices, but in much of America, you have one option. It's the reality. You have one option. Not saying that's the way we want it to stay, but as it exists today, that's what it is. So if you're going to make progress in these areas, you almost always have to engage the, the ISP. There's just, there's no other, there's no other option around it. And they're the ones who have the information, they're the ones who frequently have the customer, and they're the ones who have control over each end of the equation. So having them be part of this is important. That's why President Biden brought basically everybody to the table to make sure that they were going to give these $30 plans as an option for the Affordable Connectivity Program so that people could have internet for zero cost. Got to engage them. That's the way that it works. The second question is, what's the, what's the accountability? And um, I would take that from two different perspectives. One is, I know that I'm going to be held accountable because GAO and uh, the inspector generals, they are on us all the time. And, um, and the second piece is, we're trying, we got to make sure that states who are receiving these monies are accountable. And so, um, not this is no longer where where I am because uh, got kind of got this other portfolio now. But um, the Department of Commerce is going to end up having to approve every single digital equity plan that comes from a state. And uh, I spent much of those part of the reason I was traveling all those times is to communicate with governors and states and leadership and people like that, so that we can 
ensure that those plans look like. Uh, they don't have to all look the same because Pennsylvania is different from Tennessee, which is different from California, but we need these elements to be part of what goes on and that's critical. Um, as I started, let me just say that um, Pittsburgh has had an had a amazing transformation, as has all of Western Pennsylvania. Everybody in this room knows that work isn't done. I look back at those cards before I got started, a lot of things to be done. And infrastructure, and particularly internet for all, is a huge piece of that. We want to be part of the, of the uh, solution. On behalf of President Biden, I'll tell you that the administration is committed to this work. And thank you all so much for being here and uh, being, being part of the work. Thank you so much. Thank you.